Hi, I'm Matthias Beck. I'm one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. And in this video, we will finish our discussions of zonotopes. We will give a formula for the Erhard polynomial of a zonotope, and we'll make some brief remarks about connections to hyperplane arrangements. Let me remind you that in the previous video, we explained corollary 9.3, namely if we have a lattice zonotope for which we have a decomposition into half open parallel pipettes, and we explained how that works, then we can compute the Erhard polynomial of the zonotope by finding the relative volumes of the various parallel pipettes in this decomposition. My goal now is to explain to you how to get from this result to theorem 9.9 .9 that you can see here. It's really the same formula, but it's written in a practical way. I'm looking at the matrix that one can construct from the generators of the zonotope. So if my zonotope is the Minkowski sum of the vectors u1 through un, I make them the columns of a matrix. And now what this theorem 9.9 .9 says, I can compute the Erhard polynomial by going through linearly independent subsets of those columns, produce a submatrix if you want, and then compute all minors of the submatrix, and then take the GCD of all minors. And my claim is that this will give you precisely the coefficients of the Erhard polynomial. So this is computationally appealing because if you have a zonotope like the one on the right that you can see here, let's say generated by four vectors in three-dimensional space, what we're saying now is that you first compute the determinant of all three by three matrices given by three of those generators. They will be linearly independent and that will be the leading coefficient. Then we'll take any two of those generators and compute the minors of each two by three matrix now and then the GCD of those minors and we'll sum those GCDs. That will give me the quadratic coefficient. The linear term will be the sum of the GCD of the entries of each vector and then the constant term will be 1. At any rate, so I already told you that this theorem is really a reformulation of corollary 9.3 and so what we need to do to prove that is that the relative volumes of the parallel pipettes in a tiling of the zonotope is precisely given by these quantities um, that we call uh, m of s, these GCD of minors of the matrix formed by the generators of the parallel pipette. And so what that means is that this theorem really follows from the lemma that you can see over here. So this is now zeroing in on one parallel pipette. The situation is that I have some linearly independent vectors, w1 through wn. They live in some d-dimensional space and they're integer vectors. And now I compute the parallel pipette spanned by those vectors. So this will be an n-dimensional parallel pipette in d-dimensional space. And you can see this is a half-open parallel pipette, just like in the last video. And just like there, I can make my parallel pipette half open in different ways and the conclusion of this lemma will not be changed. And so now what we need is that we will compute all n by n minors, correct? So these are the largest square submatrices of the n by d matrix formed by those vectors as column vectors. And then we'll compute the GCD 
of those miners. And the claim is that the GCD of those miners is the relative volume of the parallel pipette. And once you have this, the number of integer points and the Erhard polynomial, if you want, of this half open parallel pipette will be given by this GCD times the appropriate power of T. This is really the same argument as what we had in the previous video. So let me briefly summarize the steps and just remind you of how we built this up. We start with the zonotope. We have our tilings into parallel pipettes of various dimensions. Then we can compute the volumes of those parallel pipettes and then realize because of the uh, very special properties of the zonotope that those volumes give you the Erhard polynomial coefficients. And now the last step, and this is what we'll show now, is that those volumes can be computed sort of purely in a linear algebra fashion. So this result follows from a linear algebra result. It's a construction that, that's called the Smith normal form. of a given matrix to apply this over here and I'm thinking of my matrix as given by these column vectors w1 through wn so this will be a d by n matrix and the Smith normal form is the following construction it says that if A is full rank, which it is in our case, so we're assuming that W1 through Wn are linearly independent, then we have two matrices that I'll call S and T. So S will be an M by M matrix and T will be a D by D matrix. They're both going to be invertible. So they both have determinant plus or minus one, such that the product of my three matrices, S times A times D, so this will be again a D by N matrix, has sort of almost diagonal form. So um, it has well, quote-unquote diagonals and then there's zero down here in the remaining uh, rows and and also all the way up here in this n by n submatrix and um, the product of these diagonal entries is equal to the GCD uh, of all n by n minors of the original matrix A. Yeah, so I will assume the result is given and now explain to you why this is helpful. I can really think of my matrices S and T as transforming the parallel pipette pi into a sort of rectangular parallel pipette. If you think of T as a map of Z to the D that preserves the lattice and S as a map of Z to the M again preserving all the integer structure that there is then I can think of these two sort of operations as mapping the given parallel pipette to a parallel paper that's given by those diagonal entries. And so this is really sort of, I have a, a line segment in each dimension, and I guess it's open this way. And 
And so now you mean what I mean by rectangular parallel pipette. So I have a two-dimensional picture would look like um, this. I'm going out, you know, by D1 in one dimension and D2 in another dimension. Um, and I have this sort of half open rectangle. So what we're doing now is the same construction in dimension n, but this now lives in d dimension. So we have a n-dimensional rectangular parallel pipette living in d dimension. And of course, the relative volume of this thing is the product of the dj's. And so Smith normal form tells me that this product is equal to the GCD of all the minors of my original matrix A. But my matrices S and T, because they were invertible matrices, they preserve volume. And so the volume of my original parallel pipette is equal to this, to the volume of this new sort of easier rectangular parallel pipette. And we know that volume. And so if I put everything together, I get lemma 9.8. And again, since this was the main ingredient of this theorem 9.9, .9, this shows why this theorem holds. Let me finish the video with a remark that zonotopes have a connection to a whole world in combinatorics and discrete geometry. I will show you a connection to hyperplane arrangements, but I encourage you to explore the world of oriented matroids for which zonotopes are one point of entry. A hyperplane arrangement, here yeah, let me use a fancy H here is a simply a finite set of hyperplanes. In some d-dimensional space, the only example I can draw is in two dimensions. So you might have, for example, these three lines, which is what a hyperplane is in dimension two. And so the way I'm thinking about a hyperplane arrangement is by looking at its complement. So if you now take the space where you're in and set, subtract all your hyperplanes, you're left with some sort of maximal connected regions. And those are called the regions of the arrangement. So in our example, we have six regions. One of them is, uh, for example, up here. And you can see that each region will always be a polyhedron. And so a hyperplane arrangement comes with faces. Namely, what I'll do is I'll, I'll consider all of the faces of all of my regions. Each region is a polyhedron, so it has faces. And so there's a rich structure of faces of a hyperplane arrangement that sort of mirrors polyhedral geometry and the study of faces there. Our example that you see here is a central arrangement. And what that means is that all my hyperplanes go through a point and I might as well make this point the origin. And that now gives a connection to zonotopes. Namely, if somebody hands me a zonotope, generated by the vectors u1 through un, let's say, I can consider sort of a corresponding hyperplane arrangement by 
taking the set of all hyperplanes with normal vectors, one of those UJs. So let's go back to our example. If I consider the hexagon from the previous video, this was generated by three vectors, then you can see the associated hyperplane arrangement is precisely the arrangement of my three lines that you see on the right. My three lines are orthogonal to the three vectors. Here's one line, here's the second one, and the last one. At any rate, you might notice that my hexagon having six vertices might have to have something to do with the fact that we have six regions in the corresponding hyperplane arrangement. And I claim this is always true. The vertices of my zonotope somehow correspond to the regions of my hyperplane arrangement. But actually, much more is true. Complete face structure of the zonotope can be seen in the complete face structure of my hyperplane arrangement. This is just a teaser to entice you to look more into this. I invite you to do some of the exercises in chapter 9. And then, as I said, look in literature on oriented matroids or more special papers on hyperplane arrangements or isonotopes.